And today that's going to be what I'm going to address as well. So if you would stand with me one more time and turn with me in your Bible, we'll stand out of respect for God's Word. And uh, might turn me up just a smidgen there, Mr. Jeremy, if you would. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 9. And we're going to begin reading with verse 35. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary, my margin says harassed, and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, how many of you are a disciple of his? He saved us this morning. The harvest truly, what do you mean when he said truly? Really? Actually? Showed us? Without a doubt? The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your anointing upon your word today. Give us hearts to receive the word, to be receptive to your will in our lives. And Father, as we've already prayed, let our minds be clear of every distraction that we can truly focus upon your word today to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I've entitled the message today, just simply enough, The Waiting Harvest. The Waiting Harvest. Remember last week we looked at another parable of Jesus where he talked about the kingdom. But in that parable, the, the, the seed was not the word. The seed was us. The harvest last week was the end time. And the angels were the ones that would gather the tares and, and, the, and, and burn them and gather the wheat into the barn. Last week, the reapers were the angels. The harvest was the tares and the wheat, or the lost and the saved. The harvest time was the end of the age, and the wheat and the tares were to be left alone. I mean, remember last week's message. They were to be left alone. Well, this week, guess what? It, totally different direction. Jesus has given us a different angle of the kingdom of God. Today's scripture, the scenario, is completely different. Today's scripture, the reapers are not the angels. The reapers are the children of God. They're us. Say they're us. They're the us. harvest is the lost who have no shepherd. The harvest time is not the end of the age. The harvest time is now. And the harvest is not to be left alone. It is to be brought into the barn. Now I know what you're thinking, Pastor. I know where you're going with this message. You're going to tell us that we ought to all be out bringing people into the church. But now last week you told us our mission wasn't in the church. It was out there in the field. Absolutely. <laughs> I realize that and I understand that. But listen, why did we say we're to come to church? We said that we come to church to get equipped to do our mission in the world. Everybody remember that? This is where we come to get equipped. Getting equipped and trained is called discipleship. Everybody say discipleship. Discipleship. Now, what did Jesus command us to do? He said, go into all the world and make disciples. Very little disciple making is going on today. Why would you bring people 
into the church to make disciples out of them so they can do what? So they can go out and make disciples. Y'all got it. We may as well go ahead and go, on, go home. Y'all got it. John's got it anyway. <laughs> now, guess what happens to the church when we go out to make disciples who go out to make disciples? It grows because the church grows as the kingdom of God expands. Have you noticed that nowhere in the Bible does Jesus command us to go into the world and make converts? We're not commanded to make converts. But that's what the church seems to have settled in that area. Uh, I mean, I'm not knocking this, but I see people all the time on Facebook that say, you know, I prayed with 14 people today at the grocery store in front of the cucumbers and they gave their heart to Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. But where are them 14 people going to be next week? Right? Amen. Thank God they, for converts, but Jesus said, make disciples. And you know what? Making a disciple is a lot harder than making a convert. It really, it takes a lot more time. It takes investing your time. It takes building relationships. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. So when we go out of here into the world, into the field, if we're going to teach all things that he commanded us, what was one of the things that he commanded us before he left? Was to go and make disciples. So when we go out, one of the things we're to do is to teach those we go out to to do what we're doing, and that's to go out to, T-O-O. -O. Right? The ones we go out T-O are to go out T-O-O. -O. Okay, everybody got that? See how simple that is? Now, where are you being equipped and discipled primarily? I know it's not just in here, but primarily you are equipped and discipled where? In the church. Where are you to bring new converts to to be discipled? If they're going to learn how to disciple others, you're going to bring them into the church where they will have a shepherd. Jesus said he looked on the, on the multitude and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, scattered. And Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 says that the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher has been given to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Most folks think that the only person in the church to do ministry is the pastor or the elders or the staff. But Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 says that the pastor, teacher, evangelist, apostle, and prophet has been given to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And the work of the ministry primarily ought to be taking place where? In here or out there? Out there. I heard Adrian Rogers say, well, have you all have ever heard of Dr. Adrian Rogers? Adrian Rogers says to his congregation, he said, it's not my place to fill the pews. It's my place to fill the pulpit. Mm -hmm. I like that. Of course, a preacher would like that, right? Because mm -hmm. this is a pastor's favorite place to be. It's not at the head of a grave. Come on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not at your house when you're sick and dying. Right here is a pastor's favorite place to be. It's my favorite part of being in the ministry. Come on, Amen. Fellowship in here is how we build discipleship. Has anybody in this place found that there's somebody else in this place that's been patient with you and just loved you right on when you was ugly? Mm -hmm. Me and Teresa. I'm going to do a job, right? Okay. Has anybody else in here learned patience when dealing with somebody else in here? More hands, oh God, that ain't good. <laughs> you see, it's when, 
if we never were together, we'd never have to learn patience with one another. We'd never have to learn how to work through difficulties and problems. It's kind of like marriage. If both people in the marriage were perfect, you'd never have to work through anything. Ann and I ought to be about perfect by now. Because this last month, we've worked through a lot. Live in a camp for two weeks with somebody real close. You work through stuff. You do. It's wonderful. Lisa said, somebody said, how's the camper doing? Great. It beats a bridge. <laughs> Amen. Let me ask you a personal question. Do not answer. This is, as I tell Ann, rhetorical. How many people have you personally invited to church this week? Let me ask that again. How many people have you personally invited to church this week? Or did you think your mission was just to come to church and you've done your duty? Pay your tithe, be here, and say, Pastor, you ought to be glad I'm here. How many of you have personally invited someone to be here? Look around. Look around. Everybody look around. Smile when you do it. <laughs> Are we growing? How many new converts do you see in here? How many new disciples do we see in here? It isn't because there isn't any work being done in the barn. It's because of a lack of laborers in the field. Y'all still love me? We are worshiping in here while the harvest is waiting out there. Jesus made two important statements in verse 37 about the waiting harvest. He said, number one, the harvest is plentiful. The message Bible says, what a huge harvest. How many of you have found out that there is an abundance of hurting, lost, dislocated, lonely people all around us? As this world keeps getting worse and worse and this nation keeps going to hell in a handbasket as fast as it can possibly go, the hurting are going to be more. There's going to be more lonely. There's going to be more lost. There's going to be more dislocated people. We don't, Jesus is saying, we don't have to go to the Lonely Hearts Club to find lonely hearts anymore. You don't have to go to the hospital to find the sick. You don't have to go to the to, 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 to Skid Row to find needy. You don't have to go to the, to the house of prostitution or to the bar to find the lost. Jesus is saying, look around you. Look around you where you are. There is an abundance. Plentiful needs are presenting themselves everywhere. Would y'all say amen to there's plenty of needs and plenty of lost people, plenty of unchurched people, plenty of harvest. Amen. What is the waiting harvest, Pastor Manning? What is the waiting harvest? Show, tell, me, tell me who the waiting harvest is. What does it look like? Well, the waiting harvest consists of people you work with. How many of you work with people and every one of them are saved, sanctified, filled with the sweet Holy Ghost and act like angels? <laughs> well, see that? Not a hand. You, you, the, the harvest is plenty these people that you wish God would fire, get fired? Did you know that you might be the one there to be the light in their world and the salt in their putrefaction? But I don't want to do that. I want them to get fired. Well, they probably want you to get fired too. But see, they're not probably sitting in a sermon and in a message that they're hearing in a church today, hearing a message about how good they're supposed to be to you, like what you're hearing. They're here, they're sitting home hoping you don't show up in the morning. See, that's the difference. The waiting harvest consists of people in your neighborhood. Everybody on your street going to church this morning? Everybody on, on Grover Street. <laughs> well, everybody don't live in the boondocks, Grover. My goodness. Thank you, Lord. 
The waiting harvest is the people that you recreate with, or recreate with, or play ball with, or, or play golf with, or have coffee with at Starbucks, or at Barnes & Noble, or wherever. People at school. Is everybody at your school in church this morning? Everybody on your team in church this morning? What about people on social media? Oh, Lord, have mercy. People that God supernaturally brings into your life. How many of you have been aware when God supernaturally brought somebody into your life and you knew it was a God thing? Mm -hmm. Did you take advantage of that this week? Did he do it this week? Or did you not notice that he did this this week because maybe you were a little distracted? That's the waiting harvest. Uh, what about your family members? Oh my, you preaching now, preacher. How many of you all your family members? Just love Jesus with all their heart and love you with all their heart. <laughs> How many of your family members, are they all in church today? Are they all sitting under the Word today? Are they all in a barn somewhere today getting equipped to be a disciple? Do you know anybody that's sick and dying? I mean literally sick and dying. Do you know somebody that's sick today? Do you know somebody that's dying today? Maybe somebody that can't get into the barn, but they need to get Jesus into them before they leave the earth. What about people you do business with? Person that does your hair. Person whose hair you does. Jackie. <laughs> Miss Ann, the people that you have to deal with is buying houses. Hey, you want to you want to buy a house? This is the woman to see. She's been through hell and half of Georgia with us, and it wasn't her fault. It was the bank's fault. All right. She's put up with me on about four or five houses. If works would get you to heaven, she's a shoe in. Thirty-three percent. Thirty-three percent of America is unchurched. That means one out of three. That means if there's a hundred people on your street, 33 of them are not in the house of God this morning. Did you know what that, look, that number looks like? In America, that 33% that are unchurched, that one out of three, represents 125 million Americans. Did you know that number alone would be the 10th largest country in the world? The harvest is plentiful. That, that, that is more people than live in 230 countries in the world. We're talking about the unchurched people in America. They have no shepherd, nobody caring for them. They are what Jesus called weary, scattered, and harassed. Did you know that if you are weary and harassed, you'd probably be pretty open to somebody that would come along and ease your pains. But here's what we do. We think nobody wants to hear what I've got to say. Nobody wants to hear about Jesus. Nobody wants me to get involved. That ain't none of my business. I'm going to leave them alone. They're hurting and they're weary and they're scattered, but I'm going to leave them alone. No, listen, you're the most receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ when you don't know where to turn and you are worried and you are wearied and you are scattered and you are hurting and your mama just died or your husband just left you or, or your baby just died. You are receptive in church, what we need to do is we need to be more sensitive to who God would send to us who are receptive for the gospel at that moment in their life. And quit thinking that they don't want to hear what I got to say. They are dying to hear what you got to say. We got to get out of this four wall mentality that our mission is here. No, this is where we are equipped to go out there and do what Jesus called us. Jesus said the harvest is plenty. There's no shortage. He also said the laborers are few. Why are they few? Well, the first reason the laborers are few is because we, the would-be laborers, are
are waiting for the harvest to come see us. You know, if we build a nice little building out there on 56 that don't look like a church and it won't scare people, they'll just come pouring in. And it's been eight years. They ain't poured in yet. I'm glad you trickled in. I mean, be glad you trickled in. Did you know that there's some more people out here that would be glad they trickled in if we'd help them trickle? Amen? Amen. Nowhere in Scripture are we encouraged to sit within our four walls and wait for the wheat to come marching in on its own power. Any of you that are farmers, you can say, come here, okra, come here, corn. It will die in the field. You've got to go get it. Are you listening this morning? I, listen, it's not going to harvest itself. That's the whole point, Jesus. The, the, the harvest is plentiful, but it's the laborers that are few. It's not the harvest that's few. It's the laborers that are few. A pastor once told me, he said, I don't want my church to grow because the more people you have, the more problems you have. No, here's what, here's what it all, here's how you ought to look at it. The more people you have, the more harvesters you have. And the more people you have, the more disciples you have to make other disciples. Right? That's the way we ought to look at it. I have another preacher that said, you know, I wouldn't mind ministry, I wouldn't mind ministry to go for the people. <laughs> now, I have thought that. I have thought that before. You know, if I could just stand behind a pulpit and preach, I could preach all day long. I could preach a year and just never stop. But what's it for if there's no people? Right? What's the use to build a nice barn and a nice silo, but you don't have any grain? All you get is a bunch of echo. <laughs> you know, no, nothing in the barn. There are more people with needs than there are people willing to help those needs, meet those needs. That's simply what Jesus is saying. And a lack of laborers is caused by two things. First of all, it's caused by a lack of compassion. Verse 36. But when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. Have you ever noticed that it was compassion that moved Jesus? And I believe that I could say that you and I won't be moved to do any more than we're doing right now. Let's just come on Sunday and sit and worship and go back home and say how wonderful our church is until we're moved with compassion for the lost. The church has lost its compassion for the lost. We're, we're more interested in getting a word from God or be told how, you know, that our, our best days today and God wants us well and rich and all of our problems are going to disappear when we receive Jesus. And we've totally forgotten about the lost. We've lost our compassion. We will do nothing to help others until our love for them moves us to action. That's what compassion is. Love in action. I've got two scriptures I want you to turn with me to, to that, that says exactly what we're saying here. James chapter 2. Let the word speak to you today, brothers and sisters, please. I'm like the three black ladies that on that bell bondsman job. I ain't mad at you. I'm just giving you the word, all right? I'm just giving you the word. Look at James 2, 15 to 17. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. How many of us come in here with dead faith and we go out with dead faith because we don't do anything out there for those who need to see our faith exercised? Look at me at 1 John. Go to the right. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. 1st John 3, 17 and 18. 
This proof, this a little bit stronger here. John got a little bit stronger here than, than, than James. 1 John 3, 17. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Amen. Here, here's what compassion is. Are you listening this morning? Here's what compassion is. Compassion is seeing people through Jesus' eyes. I'm afraid that the church world doesn't see the homosexual through Jesus' eyes. I'm afraid that the church world doesn't see the drug addict through Jesus' eyes. I'm afraid the church world doesn't see the alcoholic through Jesus' eyes. Most of the church world don't even see the divorcee through Jesus' eyes. Amen. The church world, for the most part, doesn't see the single struggling mother through Jesus' eyes. They just say, well, I wonder what she did to make him leave her. We will not have compassion until we see people through Jesus' eyes. And the only way we can start seeing people through Jesus' eyes, are y'all listening this morning, is to begin to pray for the people that need Jesus. How much time have we spent? When's the last time you shed a tear over a lost soul? When is the last time you shed a tear over a lost soul? You see, when we pray for the lost, when we pray for those people out there that are dying and going to hell at the rate of 89 per minute, how many people have gone to hell since we started an hour and eight minutes ago? Somebody, somebody type in 89 times every how many minutes it is. We, uh, an, an hour and, and eight minutes ago. And when you get that, raise your hand. But when we start praying for people who are lost, we will have a compassion for them because see, yes sir, 6,052 people have slipped off into hell since we started this service. 6,052. More than that now, I'm going to add another 89. But see, when we start praying for people, we have time invested. Did you know you can't be prejudiced and hate somebody when you're investing time praying for them. Because see, whatever you got your time invested in becomes precious to you. If you have a hard time with the folks with the tattoos and the spiked hair and the lips out to here and the bowls in their ears and, and the britches that they paid $400 for that we used to have to be beaten and put on the school bus to wear clothes that looked like that. You know, if we had a tear in our jeans, we didn't want to go to school. Now they don't want to go if they're not torn all to pieces. <laughs> If you have a problem loving somebody like that, you start praying for them and it'll be, you'll be amazed at how much you'll quit hating them and start loving them and your heart will come toward them. Find the most difficult people you find it to love and you start praying for them, even if it's your spouse. And? <laughs> and you'll be amazed that when you have time invested in them, prayer time, you will begin to have compassion for them and you won't feel yourself being as distant from them. You'll feel drawn to them. A lack of labors is caused by one other thing too. Not only caused by a lack of compassion. God give us a, a compassion for souls. But a lack of laborers is caused by a lack of prayer for God to send laborers. Jesus said, pray that the Lord of the harvest send laborers. He told us what to pray for. Now we pray for, you know, God, I hope I hit the lottery. You know, Lord, I pray that, you know, this lump isn't cancer. You know, I pray that my husband will straighten up. I pray for this, I pray for that. But how many of us really pray? When's the last time you prayed, God, send laborers into the field? 
Because then when you say, I can preach this message even though it's uncomfortable for me to preach it because I, it comes across a little fussy. But this morning, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt what I'm preaching to you is the heart of God. So I can preach it with confidence because I know that I am making God smile whether it makes you cringe or not. This is the heart of God. The, the lost world is, a, is the heart of Jesus. Yeah. And see, a lack of prayers to send laborers is part of the reason that the laborers are few. You see... We should not be praying, Lord, and I prayed this, and you have too. God, send people in here. We ought not be praying, Lord, send people into here. We ought to be praying, Lord, send people out of here. We ought not be praying for the harvest to come in. We ought to be praying for harvesters to go out. Amen. Jesus made it plain here. He said this so plain. He, he, he almost all but has a stamp of a, uh, with a promise on it saying, if harvesters will go out, the harvest will come in. It's almost, a, it's almost a sealed promise. If the harvesters will go out, listen, you go out in your garden and pick corn, I guarantee you that corn's coming in the house. Come on. The okra's coming in. You ain't going to leave it out there in the field, but it ain't going to march up your back doorstep in it by itself. If you go out, it'll come in. That's what Jesus is saying. That's all he's saying. The late, great Vance Havner, who was one of my favorite preachers to read after, said this. When anything good comes our way, we usually tell it. Strange that the greatest good news of all should find us holding our peace. Maybe we have just become canvassers looking for members instead of gatherers looking for souls. Vance Abner. I've said all that to say this. There is someone, say someone, there is someone out there that you, say me, say I, can and must bring to Jesus. Here's something that each and every one of us can do. I'm not asking you to be a theologian. I'm not asking you to quote every word in the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. I'm not asking you to be able to prepare a sermon or to sing like a canary, but here's something that every one of us here can do. Every one of us can bring at least one unchurched person into the atmosphere that we enjoyed here today, into wonderful praise and worship, into a loving fellowship where they'll be loved, where they can hear the Word of God, be taught the Word of God. Every one of us, listen, every one of us can bring at least one person into this church once a month. With all of the harvest out there, all the hurting people you know, all the sick people you know, all the dislocated people you know, all the lost, lost people you know, can you find one a month to bring in and let the Holy Spirit minister to them? Just one. One per month. One per month. One per month. <coughs> Show them Jesus out there. Then bring them in here where they can be discipled to show someone else Jesus out there. That's called harvesting. It's called discipleship. Show somebody the love of Jesus out there. And bring them in so they can be taught how to show somebody else they know that's hurting the love of Jesus out there. Oh, and one more important thing. 
while you're praying, Lord, send out laborers into the field, don't forget to pray what Isaiah did. Here's the catch. What did Isaiah pray? When you're praying for the Lord to send laborers, don't forget to pray this. Lord, here am I. Send me. And guess what? He will. And then, the most important part, obey. Amen. Obey. Lord, send laborers. And while you're sending them, here am I, send me. Okay, I'll go. See how simple? You don't have to drag them down the Roman road. One good thing you say, listen, is there anything going on in your life right now that I could pray for you about? Very few people turn down prayer. Very few. Is there something going on in your life I could pray for you? Listen, hey, our pastor's teaching us how to minister to hurt and broken people. And I'd love to invite you to come see what God's doing. We just got a bunch of hurt and broken people that God's working on. We're all just a bunch of misfits. You ought to see us on Sunday. By the way, why don't you? Why don't you just come see us? Hey, I'll come by and pick you up. You ain't preached one sermon. You ain't given them a Bible scripture. You just said, I love you. I'm going to reach out to you. I care, I care because you hurt. I'm gonna, let, us, let us pray about what's going on in your life. Now, Listen to this and we're going to close. Usually when the preacher says we're going to close, it don't mean anything. But we are. I got that far. And we know. Alright? There is a... You know, I've asked this question. Um, and I know this is going on the internet, so I'm going to, I'm going to be sweet. Um... <laughs> Have y'all seen any shirts that say, I love my church? Have y'all seen any ends? Ends? Yeah, N. Yeah, the letter N. Well, listen. I've come to this conclusion and see if, am I right or am I wrong? The difference between a growing church and a dying church. And how many of y'all know if we're not going forward, we're backing up? I told you to look around in here. Do we see new converts? Do we see new disciples? Is it going the right direction? No. So the difference between a growing church and a dying church. I've discovered it's not the quality of the preaching. It's not the choice of the music. And it's not the style of the building. The difference between a growing church and a dying church is simply this. It's whether or not its members are inviting and bringing in the waiting heart. That's as simple as I know how to put it. Whether we die or whether we grow, it's not a, how good I preach, how good they sing, or what the building looks like, or what we're going on. It is are the members bringing in the harvest from the field. Amen. That's the bottom line. I know some churches that are growing and the preachers can't preach. Is that ugly? You've listened to them. I know some churches that are growing and the, the music sucks. Is that ugly? I know some churches that are growing and meeting in a storefront and the building's falling in. Why are they growing? Because the people are taking this commission of Jesus seriously and out in the field they are bringing in the sheaves 
They are bringing in the harvest. They're not waiting on the harvest to come in magically one Sunday. They are taking the word of Jesus literally and saying the harvest is plentiful and the flavors are few. I like what Pastor Don in Centerville Mission says. He says the woods are full of lost herd people. Go get you one. One a month. One a month. You get one a month. In three months, what would it look like around here? By Christmas, what would it look like in six months around here? If every month everybody brought one and told somebody else to bring one. It's like an Amway meeting, isn't it? <laughs> Circles. You get you two, you get you two, you get you one, you get you one. You teach this one to get one, that one to get one, that one to get one, and that one to get one. Guess what? It's called discipleship. This ain't rocket science. It's just us obeying what Jesus told us to do. And Jesus has clearly said, if we'll go out into the field and harvest and reap and gather, the harvest will come in. Amen. Now, how many of us are willing to take this message to heart and not let this be just another message that Pastor Manning has preached. But we will say, God, help me to not be a hearer of the word, but a doer. And I want to do my part to build the kingdom and make disciples. How many of us will do that? Amen. I believe you will. And I believe we will. And I believe in a few months and a few weeks, we won't recognize this place. You know what I wish we had to do? about every six months I wish about every six months we had to replace the carpet on this altar where the tears had rotted it out to the concrete Amen. wouldn't it be wonderful Amen. wouldn't it be wonderful if there were some stains on this altar and we just leave them there tear stains where people <laughs> weep themselves and pray themselves through to a merciful loving God Folks that are scattered and displaced and weary and lost and feel like nobody loves them. I'll guarantee you, if you'll pray the Lord, send me, He will send you to just the perfect person this week, next week, and the next who feels like nobody cares. And you'll be amazed at how receptive you'll be. If we just keep waiting on them to come, eight years from now, we'll be looking at the same thing we're looking at right now. And we cannot say that we built the kingdom. But if we'll obey the word of God, he'll do his part. He'll do his part. He said the laborers are few. Lord, add one more laborer. Here am I. Send me. And I know you'll send me to the person who's receptive, who will come in, find Jesus, and go out and find somebody else. That is the kingdom's dynamic of building the kingdom of God. And I know that's what we want to do here. I know we're not satisfied with just the same old, same old. And you know what? <clears throat> Neither is God. He wants to work with us. Let's give him something to work with. Let's don't be like the preacher that was scared to death. He was going to preach his first sermon and he was in the bathroom at the church almost nauseated down over the pulpit, down over the pulpit, down over the toilet. <laughs> about to throw up. And he said, Lord, anoint me. Lord, anoint me. Lord, anoint me. And God told him, said, get up off of this toilet and go in there and get behind that pulpit and give me something to anoint. Mm. So if you'll give God something to anoint, he'll anoint it. You go. He'll go with you. Because he said, right after he said, go into all the world, make disciples, gather in heart, he said, I am with you always. Amen. I'll be with you. You can guarantee that whoever the Lord leads you to, the Holy Spirit's already been there before you get there to prepare their heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand together.